Okay, I think we're probably good to go. I think so. Uh, good morning again, everyone. And um, thank you so much for joining us um, for our webinar this morning. Uh, it's great to see so many of you here and we're looking forward to get st getting stuck into the topic. And yeah, we hope you are too. So I will just do a quick introduction, if that's OK. Um, I'm Noel Dowds. I'm the distribution consultant here at Zurich, and I'll be hosting uh, the webinar today. And um, I'll be doing that alongside our two presenters who I'll introduce very shortly. Um, the webinar today is, as you all hopefully know, uh, building digital trust. Um, and it's all about cyber risk management solutions with Zurich Resilient Solutions, ZRS. Um, a little bit of housekeeping, if that's OK just before we get kicked off. Um, the call is being recorded and we will be sending around uh, the link uh, once this has been uploaded to YouTube at some point today, we're hoping. So um, keep your um, yeah, keep your eyes on your inbox if that's something you want to see or if you want to send it on to colleagues um, and we will get that sent around to you. Um, we are, after the presentations today, uh, planning on putting 15 minutes aside for a Q&A. So, throughout the webinar if anything um sort of piques your interest or if you have any questions that you brought along with you today please do and um, put them in the chat and it would be great to pick through as many of those as we can uh, at the end of the at the end of the session and we will also be providing a link um where you can provide some feedback um should you wish to um on what you've enjoyed about today and what you might like to see more of um so without further ado i will introduce our speakers um we have um, two people with us here today. So we have Aaron Banerjee, um, just a quick intro on Aaron. I'm sure he'll um, he'll do one himself. But Aaron is the Cyber Risk Consulting Lead for Zurich Resilient Solutions, and he is responsible for leading the Cyber Risk Consultancy in the UK. He's also chair of Zurich's Global Risk Engineering Technical Centre for Cyber. And with a career spanning of 17 years, he brings extensive cyber risk and resilience uh, consultancy experience across both public and private sector. Uh, we also have James Donald with us. Um, so James is a cyber underwriter here at Zurich UK, and he is bringing a wealth of experience to the team and has been doing so uh, since 2020. Uh, James specialises in underwriting complex risks across both mid-market and global corporate sectors and has developed a robust understanding of diverse industries and jurisdictions. His comprehensive background includes significant experience of financial lines and having held various roles in underwriting and claims through the esteemed Zurich graduate program. So I will now um, kindly pass over to Aaron, if that's OK, Aaron, and um, I will let you kick off your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Niall. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. So today we're going to uh, talk about digital trust. Okay, so digital trust is a word which uh, for the last five years is, is floating in the market and we have started talking about digital trust, whereas previously we used to talk about cyber security, then we started talking about cyber resilience, now we are talking about digital trust. Okay, so what exactly is digital trust? So we plan to cover a lot of different things, so I won't go very much deep into digital trust, but to give you a very high level understanding of digital trust. So World Economic Forum defines digital trust as digital trust is individual's expectation that the digital technologies and the services and the organizations providing them will protect all stakeholders' interest and uphold societal expectation and values. Sorry, I'm reading from that, but basically what it means that today, Look at our world. We are surrounded by technology in every aspect of our life. From the watch which we were aware, they are digital. From our cars are digital, connected with the internet. Our TVs, our blinds, people can control blinds but with their voice command. So blinds is connected with Alexa or uh, those kind of devices and you are talking with them and they are closing and opening the blinds. So the amount of data we are providing every time and the connectivity, the network connectivity across our, not only our business, our life is staggering. So that's why digital trust is very much important when you are not like delivering a business that what is the trust which your stakeholders have on your ability to deliver the business which has become synonymous with deliver the business digitally in most of the cases digital function has become the most important functions to deliver a business the operations of the business 
business. So that's why this is the digital trust model and out which security and reliability is a very important factor in that where you have to make your whole environment secure, secure and reliable and so that everyone trusts your environment to do business with you and also your internal employees who will trust that when they provide data to your internal HRs and everyone, even the, the uh, your business will take care of that. And the other thing which I want to highlight is that with the advent of artificial intelligence and all the thing, modern technologies, the how these data are collected, how they are used, the ethical, and the responsible use of it is also becoming paramount for every organization. So I want to go a little bit deeper into why this digital trust is becoming so important. For that, we need to understand our business environment in which we are living and working. So understanding exposure. So if you look into sensitive data, look at the volume of sensitive data that we are creating in today's world. Okay, in 2017, the World Economy, uh, the Economics Magazine came up with this cover page which says that world's most expensive resource. Yes, it's no more oil. It is sensitive data. Sensitive data has been the most expensive resource in the world because if you lose it, what are you looking at? You can looking at legal action, regulatory fines, not only GDPR, you are now almost every country has their own regulations to safeguard sensitive data and also financial laws. That's what you are looking at. The next thing is digital environment, automation, remote working and AI. I have put the whole thing in one, one bucket, but what I want to uh, kind of highlight out here is the connected nature of our digital ecosystem. Like everything is connected in today's world. Okay, so like for example, uh, the UK government came up with this uh, article, Glasgow becoming world leading smart city. Okay, what does that mean? That means the traffic lights and all the other controls which will impact people's life while they go to the city center, other areas, drive their cars, walk on the road is centrally managed. That also means if anyone with a malicious intent can go into that environment, they can actually control how the city operates. That is exactly the case in the world of uh, all the operational technology the, in the manufacturing sector, the construction sector who use the operation technologies, all those things which were previously manually operated are nowadays operated by a computer. So that's why we are creating this huge exposure. And if, if anybody uh, exploits the exposure, we are looking at business interruption, financial loss, and also the cost of replacement. Okay. So what I want to highlight out here, there is this gathering cyber storm, which is partially driven by an explosion continued year on year by the technology innovation. And at the same time, uh, the increasing dependency on technology, which actually grows the potential of organizations coming under harm. So this amplifies the interest of threat actor because these environment, they are so connected, this amplifies all the interest of threat actor because they want to exploit those connectivity, the vulnerabilities in the systems and the environment, and they want to monetize that. At the end of the day, what they want to do, they want to monetize that. So the final thing which I want to highlight out here is electronic fund. We are using electronic fund. So if anybody has electronic by like access to the electronic fund, we are looking at potential financial loss. So on a very high level, these are the financial exposure which we are which we are looking at. And cyber criminals are trying to exploit this. So this is a small stat which says that 90% of world's data has been created in the last two years. That's true. Like in the just in the last two years, we have created 90% of the data which we have collected from the beginning of time, literally from where our known history starts. 90% of the data has been created in the last two years. Because everything, like all the comments in LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, everywhere, those are data that tells about you, that tells about me. So, and cyber criminal wants to exploit that because if they have access to data, they can actually use those data to manipulate you, manipulate me, and also monetize that. 
That's why you will see World Economic Forum, every year they come up with this annual risk report. This year, cyber insecurity is, uh, uh, is number fourth risk in short term and number eighth risk in the long term, in the 10 year. Okay. What I want to highlight is that last year, the same report said that widespread cyber security, uh, cyber crime and cyber insecurity in short term is number eight. And in long term, it's also number eight. It just took one year from eight to jump from eight to four because of the huge number of cyber attacks, which we are getting to see every day. So the cyber crime is expected to, to cross 10.5 trillion annually by 2025. It, that makes it the third largest economy in the world after US and China. That's a lot. That's a big number. If, if cybercrime becomes like 10.5 trillion annually. So what has been the biggest cyber attack in terms of data breach? As far as my knowledge goes, like this in the last 12 months, uh, this uh, Ringo and Park Mobile, they lost approximately, I think, 21 million records. So whoever has parked their car and used Ringo and Park Mobile, there is a chance that your details, including your financial details, your card details, are with some cyber criminal. And this happened in December 2023. So... IT governance comes up with this lovely report every month, every quarter about like the number of breach. You can go and see how the, the number of cyber incident keeps on changing every month. Like out here, you can see that this is like publicly disclosed incident, which had some impact, not just like I have a data breach kind of thing. This is like publicly disclosed with huge impact. And you can see like across Europe, every month, there is at least 120 kind of incident which is happening, which can grab the headline. It, it is worthy of going to the newspapers. So it's an everyday matter. So what do you think is the high, is the sector which gets targeted the most? Public sector. Public sector by far has the total number of uh, records breached in Europe. I'm talking about Europe out here. And public sector also has the highest number of incidents reported, followed by IT services and software for the known record breached and healthcare for uh, the public to disclose incident. The thing is, if you look into the global stats, this is the European stats, which I'm showing you out here. If you look into the global stats, it is just the reverse where in number of publicly disclosed incident, healthcare is number one, <clears throat> whereas public sector is number two. And in number of records breach, IT services and software is a number one and public sector is number two. So public sector is still one of the two in globally or in Europe. Okay, so it is exploited quite a lot. So if you look into the cyber threats that uh, I will rank as the most concerning for every organization, what every organization should keep an eye on. So I have my own list, which I want to talk about. So the first one everyone should take care of is insider threat. So these can be your uh, employees making silly mistakes, like honest mistakes, okay. Or this can be disgruntled employees. It's very important we have right controls like by control, I mean people control, process control, and technology control. Cyber controls are not just technology. I want to <clears throat> say it again. Cyber, like safeguarding our organizations for cyber security against cyber criminal doesn't only mean technical control. Technical controls are definitely a part of it, but also it's very important to have the right processes and the right people control, educating people and making them aware. So insider threat is one of the top one, which I think impacts every organization, especially for the public sector or the health sector. What happens is insider threat is one of a very important thing where you have huge volume of people uh, dealing with huge volume of sensitive information uh, so that's one thing to look out for. The next one is targeted and untargeted malware attack, like ransomware. Like everyone knows ransomware is the killer. It's like everyone is trying to safeguard their organization against ransomware attack, rightly so, that you everyone should try to do that. So, but 
malware attack can be a lot more than ransomware attack it can be also ddos attack there are various organizations who were targeted with ddos attack that's distributed denial of services but basically your computer is bombarded with requests so that it doesn't have the computing capability to react or respond to all those requests okay so those kind of attacks has happened quite a lot so keep an eye for ransomware attacks and ddos attack but ransomware is by far the biggest killer by far okay and we are getting to see that the ransomware demands which were previously like 1 million 2 million it went on to 7 million 8 millions and nowadays it's like 40 50 million is going high and high almost every day Business email compromise and social engineering. This is a very important threat to consider. Business email compromise, where someone compromises your email addresses, your business email addresses, and use those email addresses to target others in, in, in the business. Now, you might be thinking, I am not a target. Why would someone target me? Okay, maybe like a, a new new joiner in the company or a very junior employee might think like, why I am a target? No one will target me. Okay, but people will target you. Why? Because when a cyber criminal wants to exploit you with, with phishing or business email compromise, all they want to get is your trust and then break use that trust to break someone else's trust. It's a game of whole trust happening out here. So that's why if they can compromise your email address, you might be like a very new employee, a junior employee, but that can be used to send an email to your manager or to the HR department saying something like, oh, uh, I'm resigning and this is my resignation letter. If, send, if you send that to your manager or HR, they will click on it, isn't it? And if you have a malware out there, it will drop. So those kind of things, social engineering, that happens quite a lot. That's why it's very important to educate users how to spot phishing, along with having the technical control to stop the phishing from first coming into your organization. Then if someone clicks on it, making sure it doesn't um, explode and then laterally escalate. <laughs> so business email compromise and social engineering. Social engineering, as becoming a major thing, especially with the advent of artificial intelligence and defects, you will see that a lot of social engineering attack are nowadays using defect. I'm sure uh, most of you have heard about the, the, the CFO transferring $25 million in Hong Kong, which was uh, basically the, a social engineering attack where defect was used. And so there are multiple examples of where AI is used to attack organization. And AI is also getting used uh, for to create ransomwares to target organization. The fourth one is supply chain cyber attack. If you look into the attacks which happened to organizations in the last six months, okay, especially in February, you will see a lot of ransomware attacks happen. If you plot the graph, okay, uh, if you go to, go to that IT governance uh, report which I was using, it shows that it went up in February, okay. Along with ransomware, supply chain attack also went up in February because what is happening? We are living in a world where we doesn't really own any, anything. It's almost everything is a supply chain nowadays. Perhaps the only thing which we uh, owe, like own is uh, our, what do you call it, data. That's the only thing which is our own thing. Other than that, our platforms are in cloud. Our um, infrastructure is in cloud. Everything is in cloud or it's someone else's product. So that's why it is so important to not only safeguard your own organization, your micro environment, but look outside, look at your macro environment. Have I opened a back door to someone else? If they are exploited, can that be used to potentially exploit my environment? That's what is very important to understand, the holistic nature of this whole connected ecosystem, this hyper-connected ecosystem, and safeguard that have governance, technical control, not only for your organization, but across the whole connected ecosystem. So supply chain attack is very important. And finally, privacy breach. Because as I said, data is the most important thing. So privacy breach is really, really important for every, consider to, uh, every organization to consider. There are a few other contributing factors to this hazard, so which I want to quickly talk about. First of all, what we have seen, we work with a lot of company and we have seen still today, 2024, almost coming to 2025, okay? 
people are compliance focused, not risk management focused. This is one thing which I always moan about. Why are you only compliance focused? Uh, there, I'm not saying I'm not saying uh, that compliance is bad. Okay, it's good. It's required. You should do cyber essential certification. You should do all the other compliance requirement which you have. But what I'm saying is that just don't stop after doing a cyber essential certification because that's just the tip of the iceberg. You have to cover the whole thing, okay, which is under the water. So understand what is your risk and then apply the right set of controls. The next point is barrier to adopting technology with security at the core. Because still we are we live in a world where there are a lot of traditional like old legacy system. Okay, we have to think about how to make them secure. Asking just the question, like when we work with clients and we are like, do you patch? Maybe they cannot patch, they, but do they have the right compensating control? Okay, it's very important to understand that. Maybe because all the security controls should map with their business strategy. Maybe their business strategy is I cannot patch. Take the example of manufacturing or any. Is it easy to patch a computer which is in the a &E of NHS? very difficult i've spent nine years in nhs i know that very difficult at three minutes downtime you won't get permission for that very difficult so at the like on also new technologies think about security at the core it's very important okay one size fit all for cyber it doesn't happen i have seen organization they buy our product and it's like it will do all the tricks no Remember, if you're fighting vampire, garlic might work. But if you're fighting werewolf, that garlic is useless out there. So it's very important to have, understand the risk and then apply the right control for that risk. And the final one is lack of senior management commitment. <clears throat> so I will talk about the solution for lack of senior management commitment at the end. But what we get to see still, still today that the board and the senior managers if you look into the uh, the report which comes out of UK government, that will also show that there's a significant gap with senior management actually investing time, resources behind cybersecurity. It is still that IT person's problem. Sad but true. Okay. So with all these hazards, it definitely had some impact on the insurance market, I come from Zurich Insurance, so we thought it will be good to talk about what does this whole environment and the threat has its impact on uh, cyber insurance. So for that, what I will do, I will hand it over to James to talk about the present cyber insurance market. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. And yes, good morning, everybody. So I think Aaron's done a, a fantastic job there of, of really setting the scene. And as Aaron's uh, alluded to there, it's going to be my job to, you know, really provide an overview of the impact this has had on, on the cyber insurance market. So if we start with the uh, the graphic on the left hand side, I think this is brilliant and it really shows, um, you know, the real kind of uh, the real change in claims volatility that we've seen and in the last few years and as you can see really notably from kind of the end of 2020 going into the start of 2021 and as you can see it was a real drastic increase in not just the the frequency of, of claims that we were seeing but also in the severity um, of the actual losses themselves um, and as Aaron's already touched upon, you know, ransomware really, really dominates the claim. Well, it did dominate the claim space back then, and that was what the real driver in claims volatility was. And even in present day now, ransomware still really um, accounts for the majority of claims that we see, although the, the actual ransomware model itself does um, it does certainly change. But yeah, a really, really drastic increase, which obviously had significant impacts on the insurance market. Um, from both a, an internal and external point of view, um, as I say, ransomware is, you know, it accounts for probably four or five claims that we see. Um, Aaron's already touched upon, we've seen the, the actual ransom demands themselves kind of continue to increase at quite a stark rate. Um, and as a result, obviously, the insurance market has had to, um, I guess, reassess how we evaluate cyber risk off the back of that. 
focusing on focusing on the ransomware model and what that model looks like today traditionally your threat actors would get into your system encrypt your systems and then say you know we want one million dollars and for one million dollars we will provide the decryption key and you can get back up and running with your business now as general cyber awareness and and, and, and overall cyber hygiene increased um, and you know um, generally speaking businesses realize with fairly minimum controls and having the likes of offline backups and whatnot that your I guess reliance on actually paying that ransom actually really dwindles and actually if you have good cyber hygiene you don't actually you know need to make that ransom demand now threat actors were very alive to this and they're constantly evolving kind of a, a few steps ahead uh, unfortunately now that what the ransomware model looks like today they go through the traditional model of getting into your system encrypting it and also asking for that ransom demand but the difference now is that they um, are also targeting your your data so whether that's sensitive third party information or whether that's confidential business information they will use this as an added leverage in order to try and make you pay the ransom so that in itself has meant that um, we've we've seen an uptick in uh, victims actually paying the ransom because they you know they don't want the reputational damage of that data breach we've seen the actual claims costs of handling those claims uh, increase as well because you've you know there's with the focus on data there's um, more of a focus on getting the right legal personnel in there to help with the with the actual incident itself so it's been a, it's been a very very difficult um difficult few years from a from a claims perspective and that moves nicely on to the second point, which is US class actions and how this has had an impact on, uh, on, on the cyber insurance space. Now, it's very well known that, you know, the US is, a, is an incredibly litigious uh, geography and, you know, we, we do write a lot of US business at Zurich, but we also have to be very mindful um, of the heightened privacy exposures when we are considering not just risks that are domiciled within the US, but risks that have any sort of material, um, either material exposure within the US, uh, especially those kinds that you know do store or collect large quantities of data, uh, or even small quantities, but of, of of records of a you know a highly sensitive nature. Um, from a from a BI perspective, because if you really boil the cyber policy down into its most basic terms, you have you know the first party and third party triggers, third party being the privacy side and first party being you know the um, the, the business interruption elements and you know we have seen the, the business interruption elements from an internal perspective um, we've seen some significant claims costs coming out of the BI losses stemming from cyber attacks um, and this can I think this will always be a fairly complicated area of, of insurance not just cyber insurance um, but particularly particularly cyber insurance where you know the, the nature of these BI losses is um, can be can be really difficult for us to manage um, so that's that's certainly something that's I wouldn't say it's a sole driver of why you know premiums and and whatnot may have increased off the back of cyber losses, but I do think it's um, it's been a real eye opener for the industry, particularly when you go back to the likes of 2020 and 2021, because prior to those years, as you can see from the from the infographic, we really didn't see a great deal of claims. It was, I guess, generally speaking, seen as a, a bit of a cash cow. The product, you know, there weren't a great deal of claims. Those claims were were very small, um, and therefore, as a result, the, the premiums were small, the retentions were small, and the actual amount of questions and the overall risk assessment process was very, very light touch. In some cases, asking you know three, four, five questions, which is a is a stark difference from today. But it was also very reflective and arguably appropriate due to the due to the claims environment that we're ultimately trying to uh, try to assess and 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 uh, you know protect our exposure from. And then finally, you know, we've there's been various geopolitical, um, I, I guess, issues or, or scenarios that do have an impact. I mean, focusing on Russia and Ukraine, obviously, we can we can at least allege or suspect that a lot of um, a lot of threat actors uh, do come from the likes of Russia and Ukraine, and therefore, when the conflict really started to started to increase uh, in recent years we we did see a, a short-term drop off in activity uh, in terms of just threat actor activity across the globe and one theory and obviously it can only be a theory one theory is that threat actors may have been redirecting their attentions towards more nation state efforts um rather between the two countries rather than
financial motivation um, is is the number one um, you know uh, motivation behind a lot of cyber attacks. So I guess a, a common let's say a common theory may have been that there may have been faults in their efforts. But this only did last you know a few months, and it was a slight dip in frequency. And then you know after about probably between three to five months, we saw that frequency really start to increase. So it was a short term impact, but again, it's I certainly think it's worth highlighting how some of these geopolitical events can can also have a, a you know a direct impact on the on the cyber insurance which you may not necessarily join the two together now in terms of the you know the impact in terms of you know re reduced limits um i think a lot i only speak to zurich in real granular detail but um what i have what we have noticed across the market was a lot of 10 million pound lines were reduced to five million where necessary some fives were reduced to two and a half but that wasn't necessarily something we were doing here at zurich um, naturally, when there's a you know a big increase in claims volatility and claims severity rate increases, they're probably expected. We did see really, really significant um, rate increases from anywhere from 100, 200, and even plus north of 200%. Now, it is worth highlighting that generally speaking across the whole insurance market, this was deemed as a necessary uh, price correction, both on a, a retention point of view and on a premium point of view. So you, you do often hear the terms hard and soft market, and I'm not necessarily disagreeing, but given how low claims volatility was, given how low premiums and retentions were, and and then basing that on the stark difference that we saw in 2021, this was a very much seen as a necessary correction to the to, to not just the Zurich portfolio, but to many portfolios um, across the market. And there, there were just a generally a, a greater emphasis on um, ensuring that each portfolio was actually appropriate in terms of you know the sectors that we were underwriting to, and um, the amount of questions that we were asking. Um, the territories that we were operating in, and this was all, and this is always led by the claims data that we were getting both internally and externally, and um, you know, obviously trying to identify certain trends and then taking a step back and assessing, are we actually, you know, truly aware of these risks, and are we actually underwriting appropriately to that? So, from a risk risk assessment perspective, um, as I've touched upon. For some of the smaller clients, like the real small SME clients, um, even from a Zurich perspective, five, six years ago, we might have asked, you know, a, a genuinely a handful of questions in order to, to you know, be able to quote a cyber insurance policy. Um, from 2021 onwards, there was a real shift towards, you know, real robust underwriting across the market where, you know, those the amount of questions tripled and quadrupled in a, in a lot of cases. Um, it certainly isn't, wasn't and isn't uncommon now to be uh, for a client to fill out a full proposal form and, and then on top of that, fill out a ransomware supplement as well, which would essentially ask similar questions to the proposal form, but focusing predominantly on ransomware. And they were created based on what underwriters deem to be their real minimum controls. And, you know, around the time of 2021, 2022, um, it was a real extensive process, which understandably for clients that already purchased our insurance must have been really, really laborious and quite frustrating, particularly on top of then being met with, you know, significant increases in premium and uh, retentions off the back of all of your hard work and collecting that information because the underwriting process was just so much more rigorous. Um, I do personally think it was absolutely necessary and we've got a real robust structure in place today, um, but that doesn't take away from the fact that, again, this was a real sharp, sharp and sudden uh, change for clients and broke Brokers alike, so it was, um, yeah, a, a real, real impact in terms of how we as insurers started to um, actually, you know, assess cyber risk as a, as, a, as an exposure. And then finally, from a from a risk quality perspective, yeah, the the overall uh, probably unsurprisingly, when we're asking so many more questions, um, the actual standard or the minimum requirements of what we would deem to be acceptable in order to issue a quote, um, you know, the the bar really, really did raise. Where even from our point of view, back in 2021, 2022, we were probably declining, you know, 70 to 80 percent of risks, um, which isn't something as an underwriter we want to do day in day out, but it was um, it was certainly reflect of what the insurance market was was going through as a whole so it wasn't it wasn't a Zurich issue but I think it's testament to uh, you know the 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 absolute increase in in the exposure that we were trying to cover so um I certainly think it was a, a real um, interesting few years that we uh, that we all went through now moving on to more present day and, and what is happening now so um you know I think 
the start of 2023 if i appreciate i said you know we didn't want to use the terms hard and soft market but if we if we say 2021 and 2022 were a hard market and um, the start of 2023 started to see the end of that and started to see introduce the soft market now um the the soft market itself is has you know continued and has accelerated at you know a frightening pace since then i think most insurers were anticipating it would happen and it had to happen to a degree um but i think the actual volume and your pace that it came through was um was startling and i think it's not just a from a zurich lens but i think you know when you speak to underwriters from from other firms it's it, it's been very very um interesting and there's a few reasons for that First and foremost, um, you know, there have been there have been new entrants to the market, so new MGAs, and this was always something that we were anticipating. I think the success of those new entrants uh, was probably uh, has probably they've probably outsurpassed themselves in terms of how successful their launch has been. And um, so they really hit the ground running. Not all of them, of course, but I think some have been very, very successful. But I personally think the main driver of or the accelerant for all the soft market has been the the reestablished faith from a uh, reestablished faith and confidence from the more established markets, which when claims volatility started to really increase, and um, some established markets really started to either pull start to pull back from uh, writing new cyber insurance. Um, some pulled out altogether, some pulled out short term and put a bit of a hold on it. And I think once they realized how profitable it could be, if you, you know, if you underwrite it correctly with the right parameters and you've got a you know a robust assessment process in place, um, I think you know a lot of firms were under pressure to you know get out there and start writing cyber insurance. So what we were left with in 2023 and still present day is new entrants to the market. All of the established markets are all very hungry and we're all essentially going after business, going after the same business. Now, what's really worth highlighting here is different to a lot of hard and soft markets. This is absolutely not being driven by reduction in exposure. Um, you know, we've continued to monitor cyber claims, posing a significant threat in both the frequency, the severity, um, and the, you know the significance of not just the ransom demands, but also the impacts that they have on businesses. So. This poses a real challenge from an underwriting point of view because you have to get the fine balance between making sure that we are comfortable with the exposure and therefore we're comfortable with the uh, deployment. So whether it's primary or excess and our line size, the, the retention and the uh, premium, but also being cognizant of how competitive the landscape is, cognizant of the fact that there are going to be many insurers probably likely to be going after the same business and therefore taking the step back and thinking, you know, what what is the minimum that we can live with in a lot of these cases from a retention and a coverage and a premium perspective. So a very, very challenging kind of time to be underwriting cyber risk at the moment because as I say the um the actual exposure itself is showing absolutely no signs of dropping off so it's it, it's really really difficult now another really interesting takeaway that I've noticed at the moment from an appetite perspective is that clients uh probably clients are very very keen or at least open to move business away from incumbents in order to achieve better savings or just overall secure what they deem as a better deal and we've actually seen this transfer into brokers as well. So over the last two years, it's been phenomenal how many clients have actually moved brokers, um, either the, you know, either justified or potentially unjustified. Where you know you're getting brokers kind of targeting them unsolicitedly and saying, you know, we can we can get you a better deal and whatever. So it's 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 height. The competition's heightened from an insurance point of view, but also from a broking point of view. And that nervousness from a broking side is really kind of fleshed into how competitive the terms are that they're demanding from insurers because they're very conscious that if they don't deliver, deliver the absolute best terms they can for the client, there could very likely be another broker that's sniffing around and promising they can do even better. So that's been really, really interesting to notice where if you take a couple of years back in 2021, 2022, we just weren't really seeing clients moving from brokers. It wasn't really something that happened. And that was down to the fact I think clients were alive to the fact of, you know, how difficult it was to, to secure a cyber quote. And it probably just wasn't down to the, you know, the broker's capabilities. Um, from a limit perspective, um, you know, obviously I mentioned that limits did decrease from 10 mils to fives, and in some cases fives to two and a halves. And um, we've certainly seen that that ramp back up. So from Zurich's point of view, we're we're deploying more more 10 mil lines than than we have before, and you know that's been reflective across the market. We 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 have the balance of 
really getting the balance right of not issuing too many 10 mils and looking like an unsustainable market that's reduced and then increased and reduced and we, we that's never the reputation that we would want at Zurich but again we also have to be mindful of what our competitors are doing and what the customers are being offered and what the customers require so again that's been um it's been interesting to see the the shift from a limit profile perspective and also where these limits are being deployed so we're seeing a greater appetite for primary business because um, you know, there just is no guarantee of that those excess layers being achievable because the, the you know if I'm talking about a really heightened competitive landscape, that's that's increased in in times by probably two, three, or, or four times on an excess layer where you do have that ventilation of the primary five and ten mil, and that's really where the MGs are really coming into play with very very competitive pricing. So based off the back of that, a lot of underwriters are thinking, let's go for the primary business if we're fundamentally uh, comfortable with it, and let's not miss what what could be a nice um, a nice primary. Business of business and then as i've touched upon from an underwriting process um i we, we I think as a market, we did a fantastic job of creating a real sustainable and robust underwriting structure. And I think we're at a point where underwriters, brokers and a lot of clients, particularly those that already buy insurance, are, are alive and are comfortable with what is required to, to, to obtain a cyber insurance policy. And it's it's been um, reassuring that we haven't just undone all that hard work over the last few years by you know really scaling down what we're asking. However, on that point, insurers are certainly more comfortable to ask less questions, move that minimum requirement bar in order to get a quote that has been moved down. And where previously we were potentially asking for, you know, perfect risks and we were asking absolutely every question that we could think of relative to the exposure, we are asking, generally speaking, that, you know, the minimum controls that we that we would like to see. And therefore, based off that, you know, if they meet, you know, the 10 minimal, minimum areas of controls, we are generally speaking quite happy to offer them cover. So that's and I, I think that's probably going to stay. I don't think we're going to see a, a great deal of change in terms of continuing to scale that back, because I do think it's a it's firstly, it's essential to right cyber risk. And secondly, I think we've done such a good job as a market to get that into a place where it needs to be. And then unsurprisingly, from a from a rating perspective, um, we've seen significant, all of the above resulted in significant rate reductions, not just from a premium perspective, but also from a retention perspective. Um, unsurprisingly, again, broader coverage is being offered. And then in addition to that, outside of the actual policy itself, um, you know, there's been a greater focus or requirement, so to speak, of insurance offering, you know, value added services. Um, in addition to, the, to simply the risk transfer, they want to know what you can do from maybe a risk consulting or a, you know, a risk improvement perspective, which um, I'm going to let Aaron focus on, on at the end of the presentation. So it's been um, it's been a particularly challenging time um, present day, and it unfortunately shows little chance of slowing down. I do think by the time we get to next year, um, the market should, you know, it should stabilise, I would like to think. Um, but I don't think it's going to be a, a too many drastic changes. And then finally, how to make the most of the changing market from a, from a broken perspective. Th there are certainly positives here. Um, you know, whilst I've spent a lot of the last slide focusing on you know, the challenges from an underwriting perspective, um, it is also, there is a positive story there. You know, cus the customers uh, customers have a lot of options at the table. Uh, they're likely to have multiple primary options um, on, on most risks that are of adequate quality. Um, it's arguably never been a better time to buy cyber insurance from a pricing perspective and from a, from a retention perspective from a coverage perspective so for those clients that particularly those clients that don't already buy cover um i think this is the this is the perfect time to uh, to get into it um certainly worth bearing in mind what coverage um is appropriate and you know whether they need a five mil primary or a 10 mil primary and like i said there's a lot more appetite for those 10 mils than there ever has been before Consider what covers are important. Yet, as I've touched upon, there's going to be, um, you know, a broad, very broad coverage and arguably the broadest it's ever been because underwriters just have so much appetite. Um, understand what controls to focus on. Um, we do have a list of minimum controls, um, which I won't necessarily go through now, conscious of time, but if there are any questions towards the end, I'm more than happy to, to take some questions on those. But generally speaking, obviously this is a zero cleanse and it may vary per insurer, but generally speaking, this, these controls are what the market are, are, are requiring in order to get a, get a to get a quote and then finally demonstrate the journey, not just the status quo. Underwriters certainly have more appetite now to 
on board risks that might not be perfect, might not meet their minimum requirements. But if we can see a genuine uh, journey uh, of, of transformation over the last few years, and we take the view that within this next policy period or even further than that, it will be of a great standard, then underwriters are much more likely to actually take that on and, uh, and provide a quote. And I'm going to pass over to Aaron to uh, finish the presentation and talk around what Zurich can offer outside of the risk transfer solution. Thank you, James. Uh, so I will. I want to wrap up with talking about like what else Zurich can offer. So Zurich is obviously everyone knows the insurance company, but is Zurich only an insurance company? Uh, no. Right now we have uh, created Zurich Resilience Solutions, the risk engineering division, and we are doing a lot of risk consultancy. And I want to talk talk a little bit more about that. But before going into that. I don't know how many of you have been to Biba in 2023. Okay, out there, uh, Lindy Cameron, who is the NCSC's CEO, National Cybersecurity Center, uh, part of GCHQ, their CEO, she rightly said that insurance market is perhaps the only market-based lever which incentivizes being cyber resilient. It is so important. Like people who work in the world of insurance, we incentivize cyber resilience. Like it's not just a framework. You there are a lot of compliance frame work regulations which are actually forcing organization to be cyber resilient okay more cyber security i will say but we sort of incentivize so that's what we have to focus on like how can organization understand that we if they get better with cyber resilience because remember this is an article which me and Thomas Clinton, we wrote in 2021 okay uh where, that cyber resilience before cyber insurance that you have to be a resilient organization to to be more insurable resilience is really really important okay but you this year you can also see that world economic forum said that from 2022 there has been a 31 percent drop of organizations having basic cyber resilience with all those things like incentivizing cyber resilience we are an insurance company so how to help organization have developed cyber resilience and also for the fact that cyber resilience is declining in facts and figures what we are doing our zrs functions uric resilience solution function are helping organization to solve all the three problems okay so very quickly, who is ZRS? So we are the risk engineering functions of Zurich Insurance. So what we have done, we have taken decades of risk management expertise from like, because risk management is the same. It's you're doing property, cyber, liability, any other lines of business, the basic ethos and the practice of risk management remains the same. So we have taken the expertise. We are, we are taking the insights and data from our underwriting process, from our claims and everything. And we are providing data and insight driven consultancy for the customers okay which is not just for insurance okay it is to develop cyber resilience insurability will follow cyber resilience is the key word out here and we are like technical expert industry specialist thought leaders okay and um, there are a lot of uh, we are a global function so if you want have a client sitting in south africa we can provide consultants australia switzerland usa we are a global function. We have team across the world who can provide you function. And very important thing I want to highlight out here is we work for both insured and non-insured customer. So we are providing services like I'm in charge of cyber resilience solutions in the UK and we provide services for both insured and non-insured customer. I want to quickly talk about like what kind of services we provide. <clears throat> so Pre-breach and post-breach uh, services are equally important as the policy itself. So Thomas said in some other presentations, um, which me and Thomas was giving, okay. So that's why to help organization with pre-breach services, we created Cyber Complete. I don't know how many of you are aware of Cyber Complete, but please Google, you will find out Zurich Cyber Complete, where we are offering our insured customer, this is where the insured customers are coming into picture, uh, risk engineering services like Cyber Health Sector, and cyber incident response service for uh, for them to get better with their risk so a better risk uh, for our insured customer <clears throat> Along with that, we also work with customer who has no insurance offering with us. Like we are not insuring them. Like classic example is, say, for example, London Energy. Okay, so 
they came to us, we worked with them uh, just to create, create cyber resilience for them. So we carried out a cyber health check and what was found out, they have some gap. They asked for like, oh, can you help us to uh, mitigate those gap, gaps, to mitigate those risks? We helped them. And one of the things which we delivered was we delivered a managed detection and response capability, which is handled by our partner. We have a partner who provides managed detection and response capability in UK. In the US, we have procured a company called, uh, we have acquired a company, Speartip, so we can provide these services in-house. But in UK, we are using partner as of now. On the right side, you can see the quote from Frederick, who is the uh, head of IT from London Energy. Obviously, since I'm sharing the quote, he must be happy. That's why I'm sharing the quote. Okay. And... So this is a customer which I talked about with no insurance link with us and we provided them service. Why I'm showing you this? Just to highlight that we provide service as a consultancy firm, doesn't need to have an insurance offering with us just for to develop cyber resilience. But the other company who have, were struggling with cyber insurance came to us and because we are an insurance company, they want to use the data and the insights which we have as an insurance company. I cannot name them, but uh, we worked with them in 2021, did our maturity assessment, what we call a cyber health check with them, where, which came out with gaps. They said like, oh, can you help us to fill up the gaps? We did some policy review for them. We implemented risk management framework for them. Again, did a cyber health check and which kind of, um, well, um, which show that which showed progress, as James said, try to show your progress, not a status quo. Okay, try to show your journey. Cyber is a journey. It's a uh, continuous cyber resilience is a journey. You need to get better every time. So they showed that, and uh, we did crisis simulation with them. And finally, in 2023, they got insured with us because they managed to show the journey, and we helped them with that. So these are three classic examples of uh, where we help our customer with insurance, without insurance, or to get insurance, okay? So cyber resilience solutions is, we pro as I said, we provide a lot of services. We call it the cyber AMP, assess, manage, and protect, where we provide from like cyber maturity assessment to incident response planning, exercises, even things like managed detection capability. Uh, we are also doing a lot of cyber games these days if you are if you uh, follow me in linkedin you will see i have been do a, going to i was in isle of man yesterday do a, doing cyber game for the, the isle of man chamber of commerce i was in scotland doing it i was we are delivering in england so we do a lot of gamification so if you're interested please connect in linkedin and feel free to ask me the question very happy to answer that i want to finish my last slide uh, about like extending our cyber capabilities to our client, which is cyber risk quantification. Now, remember what I showed out there, uh, we, I talked about senior management commitment, okay. But I don't want to blame the senior management. I think there is a fundamental problem in which the security team communicates risk to the senior management. And the problem is the board understands the language of pound, dollar, and euro. But what we communicate in the world of security, I have spent 17 years in this business. We say like vulnerability, CVS score, and all those things. They don't understand that. So what we need to do, we need to kind of quantify a cyber risk. By quantify, it doesn't mean uh, like a five by five metrics, which people normally will do, like four uh, into four, 16. Oh, that's a high risk. No, put a pound, dollar value where we can express risk in like maximum, minimum, and most likely financial loss. Because the risk is a scenario of a loss. If you can express that, this is a service which we are delivering for our customer, cyber risk quantification. And so if anybody is interested to know more about it, or you want to explore what is cyber risk quantification, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, sorry, I couldn't give you 15 minutes for question and answer. But thank you for listening. There is recently we came out with this article closing the cyber risk protection gap. Uh, please go and download this article. I'm sure we will send you the article when we reach out to you for feedback or anything. But any question, feel free to ask. Thank you very much, both Aaron and James, for walking us through that. Um, very interesting. And Aaron, as someone who has used the Ringo app, um, that was a little bit terrifying to hear. But um, 
Yeah, probably good to know, I think. So we've got a few minutes. Um, sorry, we did overrun slightly, but we're going to try and maybe whistle through as many of these questions as possible. Um, so, Aaron, we have a question here for you, if that's all right, to, to kick mm -hmm. us off. So in your experience, what is the biggest barrier to improving cybersecurity and what makes the most impact? The biggest barrier to improve cyber security, it depends from sector to sector. There are a lot of sectors where the cyber skills gap is becoming a big barrier. You don't have enough resources to uh, take cyber security forward. So that's why a lot of decisions are being taken from which are not informed decision, not risk-based decision, but I was talking about like more compliance focus. Uh, what I have seen a lot of company will say like, oh, I have done cyber essential, I'm safe. No, you are not, okay. Cyber essential is excellent start, but that is not the end, okay. You have to constantly uh, make the plan, exercise the plan, and another thing what we saw, what I get to see is that a lot of organizations are more security focused, not cyber resilience focused, and resilience should be the key. And Mm, this this whole gap between senior management uh, or like the decision makers uh, who will actually for a fund your cybersecurity initiative and the cybersecurity team, it, I will say is perhaps the biggest barrier where cybersecurity team struggles to kind of communicate risk to the senior managers. And when they ask what is the return of investment, you struggle. Okay. Unfortunately, in the world of cyber, once you have a cyber attack, it's easy to calculate return of investment. But that is not an ideal place to be in. What we say in cyber, learn from mistakes, but someone else's mistake, not your own mistakes. Okay. So that's why like quantify risk, communicate risk to your senior management, give a return of investment, a proper business case, and that will help. And, and risk management focus, not just compliance focus. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, we have another one here. Um, Aaron, I think for you again, how easy is it for organizations to put a value on cyber risks? Mm, depends how you are doing it. Uh, if you, there are a lot of open, open source uh, spreadsheets, which you can get, if you can use it, if you have the capabilities, again, I go back to cyber skills gap, okay, then it can be challenging. So what we are doing, we have expertise within our business who work with the underwriting function to help to do, help them with cyber risk quantification. We have uh, access to data and insights, which is required because, you know, the, risk has a probability part okay that is perhaps the most complex part and to understand probability you need to understand what is the probability of that particular threat uh, being exploited sorry particular vulnerability being exploited and uh, it's resulting in an incident because the probability of a cyber attack is different from a probability of a cyber attack resulting in an incident and all those things depends upon context of where your environment is and being in the insurance industry helps because we have access to this data, those kind of data we kind of nurture because we need it when we are underwriting and we need to know that if you're a luxury brand in France, uh, what is the type of cyber criminal who are interested on you? If you are a manufacturer in the US, the, the risk profile change, definitely the threat profile change. So your risk profile will also change. So that's why uh, Still, I won't say it's like a very easy game. It doesn't happen like that. But you are better off doing with someone who knows how to do it and have access to good volume of data. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a question here from Hetty saying, do you offer discounts for cyber resilient solutions for zero policy holders? Uh, James, make this more attractive to them. James, off to you. Yep, no problem at all. Yep. So um, proudly, as of um, last year, we've started to offer uh, our Cyber Complete solution, uh, which is a, a ZRS package, which we can send some material around and ultimately concludes, uh, sorry, ultimately offers either a cyber health check or an instant response exercise. And we've been offering that complementary to all of our cyber insurance customers and also all of our prospective cyber insurance customers that were that were quoting. So, yeah, the answer is yep. And, you know, so far it's been really well received by customers. Brilliant. Thank you, James. Um, and we have one final question that I can see, um, unless Aaron, you wanted to add anything to that? No, that's fine. James has said it's good. OK, so um, deliver the services. we have we have a question. Um, do uh, what is the government doing um, with regards to um, helping to helping customers secure cyber insurance? 
James, you want to go or you want me to go? You take that one, Aaron. Uh, look at the closing of the uh, closing the cyber risk protection gap. We have talked. Uh, uh, we have talked about this. What is the government doing about it? Okay, so uh, I will say like conscious about time. So definitely read about that. I would say the government is trying. They are trying to uh, tame this beast, to be very honest. NCSC was formed in 2014, and after that, I'm a big advocate of NCSC. They do a lot of good things. The amount of materials which they have in NCSC's website is brilliant. I don't know how many of you have heard the King's speech on 17th of September last month, where um, uh, our King has uh, come up with two new bills, the Cyber Resilience Act bill, and there's another around Data Protection Act bill. So, uh, so there are a lot of initiatives which the government is actually taking. They have taken, they are taking. And the good thing is that previously it was very much on the security, like let's make cyber secure organization, but slowly the mentality is changing towards cyber resilience. Because there is a difference between cyber security and cyber resilience, and resilience should be everyone's focus. So that's what I will say. But read the closing the cyber risk protection gap. We have talked a lot about uh, pulling and all those things. That's it. Thank you, Aaron. And I think we have time for maybe one more quick question. Uh, James, I don't know if this is one you might want to take. Uh, what makes Zurich different from other insurers offering cyber insurance coverage? Yeah, great question and a perfect one to finish on, in my opinion. Um, so, you know, we're really proud of our cyber proposition. Um, and I think it's it's the whole proposition as a, as a whole that makes us different. So we have a we have a relatively broad wording, um, but the wording itself is, is fairly in line with the rest of the market. Um, one of the key differentiators would be that we have system failure built into the actual base of the wording, which some of our competitors charge for. From a claims proposition, we have, we're very proud of our in-house claims capabilities, but also our claims vendor panel, which is made up of a mix of lawyer-led and uh, loss adjusters, uh, which is Crawford's, Kennedy's, DC, Beechcroft's and Clyde & Co. Now, the real benefit here is that the client gets to choose which vendor they want to work with pre-bind. So we're, get, we're providing direct access to market lead names, and they're also benefiting from preferential rates as being part of the vendor panel. But in addition to that, what makes us a little bit different is they don't have to pick one of those four vendors that, you know, if they have a pre-existing relationship for why they should, and therefore why they should continue to work with that vendor, we're more than happy to add them onto the policy. And then finally, you know, the ZRS capability, Zurich Resolutions, that really bolsters our risk improvement solution. Uh, and I think all around, we have a really, a really robust offering there to 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 offer clients and to satisfy uh, you know a variety of needs that they have. So I do think we we've got a couple of different aspects there from a wording claims capability value added services, um, and then from an underwriting perspective, you know we're always getting complimented on 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 our service levels and the quality of our service as well. I want to just add one line to that, that our ZRS services, which we offer as part of CyberComplete or any other services which we are offering, these are like consultancy, human laid consultancy, which we offer, not a, like a technical platform where you can do outside in scan or we can also offer that. But we, it's very much like inside driven consultancy, which organization will perhaps pay and get from someone else. That's what ZRS is. It's it's not just a technology platform. Brilliant. Thank you very much both. And I think um, that is probably all we have time for today. Um, so thank you both, James and Aaron, again for, um, for your help in, and guiding us through that today. And thank you very much to everyone for joining us. Um, we hope you found it useful and, and insightful. And um, I've just posted a link um, for the feedback form for the webinar, if uh, you'd be so kind um, to, to provide any thoughts you've had on how the webinar has gone today. And yeah, hope you enjoy the rest of your Fridays and hopefully see you all soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you, everybody.